designing with titanium for strengthening concrete, Christopher Higgins. Chris is the Cecil and Sally Drinkward Professor of Structural Engineering at Oregon State University. Thanks for uh, being here this afternoon uh, to talk about new kind of material that hasn't been uh, used previously uh, to strengthen uh, existing reinforced concrete structures. And we're talking about uh, titanium alloy bars. It's really work that's been done by a whole bunch of um, my graduate students. And I always like this cartoon because this kind of epitomies uh, what we're trying to do, which is uh, keep uh, the Grim Reaper as you cross that bridge from coming into play. So first, overview. Uh, so I'll give you an introduction and background, some motivation for the work. Uh, talk about the laboratory test results from full-scale uh, specimens that represent uh, existing bridge girders, uh, both for shear strengthening as well as flexural strengthening. I'll talk about the first field implementation that uses titanium alloy bars in Oregon. Talk about a brand new ASTM material specification that uh, kind of standardizes the, this type of material. Uh, talk about an AASHTO LRFD-based design guide, and then draw some conclusions. All right, so in terms of introduction, uh, we've got a whole bunch of uh, older reinforced concrete bridges. Many were built uh, during the Eisenhower Highway expansion in the 1950s and 60s, widely used across the country. Uh, and at the time, they were using these new technology, what we now refer to as our standardized, deformed, uh, reinforcing steel. Prior to that, uh, it was the Wild West. You didn't know what kind of uh, surface deformations or if you were going to get any deformations on your reinforcing bars. And once they standardized them, they realized they had really good bond stresses. And so as a result, they could change their detailing practice. They no longer had to use those beautiful 90-degree hooks or 45-degree hook transitions to anchor their bars. They could just cut them off and have straight bar uh, terminations. And then you end up with kind of details here, and I've highlighted some cracks, show that they tend to uh, indicate at the terminations of those uh, straight bar uh, cutoffs. At the same time, the design codes that were being used were unconservative, particular for shear, because they were relying on the concrete to provide more resistance than it actually could. And if you're relying more on the concrete, you're putting less steel in. So they tend to be lightly reinforced, particularly widely spaced stirrups or small sizes of stirrups. Uh, and of course, we've continued to add loads uh, in terms of uh, the magnitude of them as well as the volume on them. And so we end up with some distress. And of course, when you use modern design codes to evaluate existing structures, uh, you tend to find that they don't uh, rate out very well, as Matt uh, talked about. And of course, you're stuck with some uh, choices. You can replace them, you can limit the loads, or you can retrofit them. And retrofitting tends to be a, uh, an economical approach. You have a lot of different materials that you're able to use. Um, you can post-tension them, you can wrap them, you can confine them, carbon fiber being the principal material. You can use another technique called surface mounting, and you can use that with either carbon fiber uh, rods or strips, as well as glass fibers. And some people have used stainless steel bars, as we have as well. Uh, when we look at FRP uh, rods and laminates, they're generally controlled by the bond failure, uh, and as a, the materials themselves are non-ductile. Think about using metallics in these applications because you're at the surface, uh, te people tend to worry about corrosion. This is what a typical carbon uh, precured laminate bar stress strain curve would look like. Elastic until it's no longer elastic and it's in two pieces, right? But it's very high strength. That's if you can make use of the material strengths themselves. So your elongations here are less than 2%, right? So you're not going to get ductile performance when you add carbon fiber uh, to your uh, structure. This is a screenshot from a video. Uh, this is surface bonded uh, carbon fiber. This is for shear reinforcing. Each one of these darker strips that you see here are the individual strips. It has a blue epoxy uh, coating. Uh, and this is the instant of failure. And essentially, you have these free surfaces. All these white marks are debonded regions. They tend to be associated around uh, cracks that you can't necessarily see because they're hidden behind the carbon fiber. And then the carbon fiber will rupture uh, at the bond surface at the free edges. Um, people have tried to now look at different ways of anchoring those free edges so you can uh, try to make better use of the FRP. This is another technique. It's called near surface mounting. Essentially, it's like uh, think about taking a router and cutting a groove to the concrete surface. So you're not just relying on the outer surface of the concrete, which tend to actually be the most deteriorated because it's been subjected to free stall exposure as well as carbonation. So by cutting past that surface and then bonding in your supplemental materials in that groove, uh, you can get a little better performance out. And you're also not holding a bunch of moisture back behind 
a, a bathtub of, of epoxy. These are test results that we've done with carbon fiber in this near surface mount. This is with a precured laminate bar. At failure, you can see the bar essentially has failed at the bond interface. I think in all the tests we've ever done, only one time we were able to get fracture out of the bar, and we think it was mainly due to bending rather than actually uniaxial tension. And so all of these failed locations are bond failures of the uh, carbon fiber uh, bars. When we use really widely spaced bars, this bottom uh, case here, you can see that every one of those zebra stripes is an embedded bar. You essentially uh, armor the skin of the uh, girder. And so the failure mode, it holds the cover intact and the, the concrete core beneath actually uh, fails, but uh, you've masked it. There's actually a diagonal crack that runs here even though all you can see on the surface is a vertical crack. Looking at carbon fiber and what it could do for us, uh, we were looking for other alternatives and really what we're looking for is something that's not sensitive to the environment. It has high strength, well-defined material properties, and it has uh, something that has an inherent mechanical anchorage at the end. And that's what led us to titanium because it has all of those kinds of properties. Of course, the next question people would ask when you say the word titanium in civil structures, they say no one uses titanium, right? It's just plain too expensive, and it really only wins when you think about uh, weight being an issue because of the high cost, and therefore, it's, or if you need a new hip, for example, or a new set of drivers, right? So a place where you're willing to make that investment in the, in the material. We can over overcome all of those, those questions. So here's what a stress-strain curve looks like for titanium. Uh, first thing you'll notice is it's uh, pretty high strength. Uh, this one's shown 145 KSI. It does not have a well-defined yield point, so you're using a 0.2% offset in order to establish that. It's typical of most high-strength steels, for example. It uh, has moderate strain hardening, but it's almost the perfect elastoplastic behavior, right? So if you're looking for a structural fuse, this is your structural fuse. The Young's modulus is uh, slightly, well, it's lower than steel. I'll, I'll have a laundry list for you later. But the real key here is you're getting 11% elongation with that high, uh, high strength material. And at the picture here, we're showing beautiful cup and cone type of ductile failure. All right, so here's a summary of the material we're using. It's actually a titanium alloy, right? So it's uh, alloyed with uh, aluminum and vanadium, 6% aluminum, 4% vanadium. This is the same material that um, aircraft manufacturers, Boeing uh, and Airbus are using. It has very well-defined material properties. It has that high strength and it has ductility. That limited strain hardening compared to yield actually protects some of the bond, right? So if you can get to yield, you can limit the bond stresses. They don't keep going up and up like you do with uh, significant strain hardening materials. It has very good fatigue resistance, uh, constant amplitude fatigue limit in the neighborhood of 75 KSI, very low tough, uh, very low notch sensitivity. So if you're worried about fatigue of your titanium, your steel is already gone. Uh, it's impervious to chlorides because it uh, essentially creates a stable oxide layer at the surface. It has a coefficient of thermal expansion that's actually highly compatible with concrete. It's got 8.6 uh, microstrain per degree C. Concrete ranges between 8 and 12. Steel's actually at the high end of that. So uh, it's, you're not going to create thermal stresses because of, it has good compatibility with the base materials you're using. Uh, we can use conventional fabrication techniques, meaning we can shear it, we can cut it, we can bend it. It's relatively lightweight, so in terms of handling it overhead applications, it's easy to lift. It's about 1.7 times uh, less than steel. And we can mechanically bend it, so we can bend in and put in a mechanical anchorage. And that's really the, the beauty of this material. We think of it as ductile carbon fiber with a built-in anchor. So how do we go about seeing how this material uh, can perform structurally? What we've done is always work with full-scale specimens because we believe there are scale effects on some of these things. These are designed to have vintage proportions based on a survey of uh, actual bridges in the inventory. And so the depth of the girder is about four feet, the width of the stem 16 inches uh, to 14 inches. It has the deck portion six inch thick, which would be typical of the time. Uh, we've done 10 shear specimens, three control. When we do shear, we use smaller diameter titanium bars, they're only quarter inch. Uh, then we've done flexural, we've done 10 different specimens, three of which are control, and for flexural we're using a little bit bigger bar, it's, uh, think of it as a number five titanium bar, five eighths of an inch diameter. And in some cases we've done um, not just strength testing, but we want to look at the environmental durability of these materials, and we have a facility in our laboratory that allows us to, at the same time that we're putting it in an environmental chamber, freezing and thawing it, 
uh, we can bounce it up and down to simulate uh, truck traffic. So combine mechanical stressing and environmental stressing. And we've done two shear specimens like that and one flexure, and I'll talk about those as well. Our typical specimen, by the way, weighs about 20,000 pounds. So we're not talking about little bench top scale specimens here. Uh, we've looked at different, uh, three different material properties in terms of uh, epoxies. So the epoxies come and go, the formulations change. Essentially, the bond stress is the key parameter for us here. The, the one we actually have been using recently is the lowest bond stress, and we still get uh, good performance out of the materials. So for shear strengthening, what we're physically doing is making a stirrup. Uh, the, they're actually shown in the picture at the bottom. Uh, we make a complete U, uh, and we can have, we also have fabricated single leg stirrups as well. And again, we're using that sur sur near surface mount, so we're grooving the surface of the concrete. At the ends of the grooves, we're hammer drilling holes to be able to anchor the hook. So there's a groove up, a groove over, a groove down, and then we hammer drill the holes, and we anchor the, the 90 degree tails into the core of the concrete so we can prevent cover uh, from wanting to pull away. And so these are discrete stirrups. We can stagger them as we need to to strengthen the girder uh, to essentially control the pitch. Because of the anchorage of the material, you can actually use the titanium alloy uh, at its yield strength, so it makes design quite easy. I should note that we do both high, uh, we tend to do uh, high moment and high shear, which is a conspiracy of force effects, which are the worst. So if I just look at a T-girder near a support where I have high shear, I have low moment. The worst is when you have high moment and high shear conspiring. And so uh, we like to uh, put the worst effects on them when we combine the high moment and high shear. And that's why we have these negative moment uh, regions uh, but we also do T-girders as well. Typical installation, we're using a concrete wet saw. It's kind of like your skill saw in your garage, only it's hooked up to uh, some water and it has better grounding. Uh, then what we do is we essentially are placing the epoxy in a bed of, of that groove after it's been cleaned, obviously, and we, we uh, can, the, the titanium is flexible enough to be able to bend it around and snap it into the grooves and it holds its position. So there's no additional, uh, the, the epoxy is non-sag as well, so there's no forming or anything required. This is a shear girder in our uh, environmental chamber, which is on a strong floor. It's bouncing up and down to simulate uh, traffic loading at the same time it's being sub subjected to freezing and thawing. Uh, for T loads, we're putting 2.4 million cycles, producing internal stress ranges in our stirrups about 13 KSI, and that's based on field measurements where we've instrumented bridges under service level conditions to figure out what is the stress range that these would, would be at, and then accelerate it using miner's rule, so we're amplifying it up higher so that we can get uh, kind of a linear damage law. Freeze thaw cycles, we've got 120 freeze thaw cycles, again, simultaneously with the high cycle fatigue. And this represents, depending on where you are in Oregon, somewhere between 25 years to 100 years of service life. We have some regions that have, at the coast, for example, which have very few freeze thaw cycles um, because it just doesn't get cold enough to freeze. And then we've got places on the west side of, I'm sorry, the east side of the Cascades that have uh, accumulates larger numbers. So really it's site specific in terms of how many, how many years of exposure you might consider. And this is what our girders look like after we take them out of the freezer and then we test them on the strong forward of failure, typical diagonal tension failure. And in this case though, there are some close up pictures, the upper one, lower one. And what we're, you see there are, those are fractured titanium stirrups. And what that means is that you have sufficient anchorage of those bars to be able to actually get the material strength out, right? So that's why you can design at ultimate. You've got good anchorage at both the top and bottom. It's literally like a real stirrup um, because of the way you can anchor that tail. Some kind of low deflection. Um, if you look at the control specimen, that's the green one. Obviously, it has the lowest strength. The red one is if we uh, look at just putting it on the strong floor after we've strengthened it without any envir or environmental durability. You can see you can increase the strength. Uh, this is the shear strength from 150 to about 225. It's a pretty substantial increase in shear. There comes the limit to how much shear strength you can increase before you're gonna get a flexural failure. So you're trying to balance these things. If we take the girder and we bounce it up and down and we subject it to freeze thaw and high cycle fatigue and then we put it on our strong floor to test it, you get the blue curve. And what you can see is that you get the same answer in terms of strength, whether you've subjected to the environmental durability and high cycle fatigue. So essentially, it doesn't really care that we stuck it in the freezer and, and bounced it 2.4 million times and froze it 120. It gets the same performance as though uh, it, it, it didn't get uh, that, let's say, that exposure. 
These are our T specimens. Uh, the control, again, is in green. You get uh, low strength, about 120 KSI. First time we did this, we were hoping to get a shear failure. If you get a flexural failure, I can't tell you anything about shear, right? So uh, the first specimen is actually the blue curve that runs out here and keeps on going because we transitioned it from a flexural failure to, uh, sorry, from a shear failure to a flexural failure. So I can't tell you what the shear strength of that one is. Um, and so the second specimen we did, we were following exactly the same path. So you get the, the red curve is a completely different specimen. It looks like it's heading to flexural failure. We said we don't learn anything if we just let it fail in flexure. So we actually change the supports, drive the shear to drop the moment. And so that's why the, the slope is a little different here. And eventually we do get a diagonal tension failure. So of course, if your design philosophy is to shear strengthen it so you can produce a ductal flexural failure, yes, it, it can be done. And then in terms of strengthening it for flexure, what we're trying to do is retrofit those bad flexural cutoff details of the embedded reinforcing bars. And so we've got bars that are terminated here, tend to be diagonal crack there, and so we simulated that by casting in place a piece of polycarbonate plastic for a diagonal crack. We essentially removed any aggregate interlock that would be on that diagonal crack. And what that does is it drives up the demand in your flexural steel, and that's what the real diagonal crack does as well. It also allows us to place the instruments where we need them. All right, so you can see on the side of the girder, we are not working on the soffit, we're working on the sides, which is actually the least efficient in terms of moment arm, but efficient enough for what we needed to do. Here's an inverted T-beam. Uh, obviously, here you're working on the soffit of the deck, uh, mainly because we're trying to not work on top so we can keep the bridge open while we're doing these repairs. Here's that polycarbonate crack I talked about, right? So there's a sheet of plastic taking you know, away a whole bunch of shear capacity, trying to drive up the demand in the flexural bars. Again, typical construction, grooves cut in the concrete. Here you can see the holes that are hammer drilled at the ends of those where our 90 degree tails are gonna be anchored into the core of the concrete. Essentially the tails almost in contact, of course you can stagger them in space so that you don't get conflict depending on the girder uh, web width that you happen to be. This is our fabrication. Uh, we warm work the bars. That's a smart material, it color indicates for you. So as you heat it up, the color changes. Uh, there's a color code that you can look at a color sheet uh, and you can tell the temperature, right? So again, uh, we heat it to this beautiful kind of straw color. We originally got a forge down here so we could control the temperature thinking it mattered. Eventually we just got to uh, heat it up with an oxyacetylene torch. These are my graduate students, of course. Um, put it in our rebar bender, bend it to 90 degrees. Uh, once it reaches that temperature. temperature, It's a pretty tight bend. It's only a two inch diameter bend radius for that five eighths inch diameter bar. All right, so here's our control specimen. Uh, again, uh, the key is there's a little diamond here or triangle that points to that flexural cutoff location. We get a diagonal crack, that, um, that piece of polycarbonate. And essentially in this case, if we don't do anything, it is, it, you, you essentially rip apart the deck. It splits because of the, um, the bond demand on those flexural bars. Uh, and you get uh, a non-ductal failure. And so we would call this actually a shear tension failure. Most people would think in a flexural terms, but there's this interaction of the shear with the flexure. Now here's one where what we have, again, that triangle is the cutoff location. The instrumented location is that polycarbonate crack that we have here. And here what we, you can barely make out that they, we have the titanium bars in the soffit on each side of the web. And what we've done is transition that girder from that diagonal tension flexural anchorage failure to a ductal um, flexural failure mode on the other side of the girder, which is essentially well anchored steel. So we've taken away the defect and we have essentially got to the capacity of the girder as though it didn't have that defect. And here's the change in performance. The blue curve here is the control specimen if we do nothing. And the red curve is that beautiful ductile performance, transitioning it from non-ductile to ductile. Um, and we're not trying to increase the strength tremendously because here, if you're increasing the flexural strength, uh, you might end up with a shear failure, which is also an undesirable uh, failure mode. Here's a case of a T-girder uh, for our uh, control specimen. Again, there's our cutoff bar, and you can see all of the, the cracking damage at the bottom. That's all associated with bond failure as you're pulling that bar out. It's not well anchored. Here's the first attempt that we did. You can see our titanium bars kind of sticking through. We actually put a big block out so we could take a look in there and we could put some instruments. That block out, what we actually did is um, took away some of the dowel action, which is pretty important to the overall capacity. And even though it would increase the strength, we thought we could do better if we didn't take that, put that block out box in there. So we redid this one. Again, a much smaller window down there to be able to look. And uh, essentially transitioned it again from that non-ductile, uh, 
tension anchor failure to a ductal flexural failure where our titanium bars uh, terminate, right? So there you have the best capacity of what the girder could be with as though that steel were continuous and that defect were removed. And here's the difference in performance. The blue is the control. The red is our first shot at it where we had that really large block out box and then the uh, yellow mustardy color one is the, um, the one if we don't put that block out box in. And again, you can see that we can get um, very nice performance out of the, the materials. Again, this is for flexure where we combine the high cycle fatigue with a uh, freeze thaw exposure. And here we've got, we've increased the flexural stresses to a high enough level that we're doing 1.6 million cycles of uh, high cycle fatigue that is equivalent to about 50 years of service life. At the same time, again, it's freezing and thawing. So control is the black, that's our base specimen if we do no strengthening. The one if we just test it on the lab floor as I showed you is the red curve. And the blue curve is if we bounce it up and down 1.5 million times and freeze it 120 times, uh, you essentially get the same answer as though you never put it in the freezer and you bounce it up and down. Environmentally insensitive, it doesn't care that you um, fatigued it before you test it to strength. Here's our first application. This is uh, for Mosier overcrossing of I-84. It's right along the Columbia River. It was built in 1952, and as Matt's bridge uh, as well, it serves two quarries. Those are the heaviest loads. One of those quarries happens to be ODOT's quarry. The bridge inspectors went out there, and they noticed some fairly large cracks, and one that had a vertical offset, which is a little bit, I guess, frightening. Uh, here's kind of the overlay of the cracks shown in red, where they were, and I kind of try to sketch in what the reinforcing cage looks like. And right at the bottom here, you can see that there's a kind of a lap splice. And if you look at the design, the moment there should be about zero. But uh, if you look at the trucks we're using now, uh, under dead load actually, that's in compression. But under live load, especially with short wheelbase trucks, that goes into tension. So the designers at the time didn't think they needed to do very much because most of the time it was going to be in compression and almost never got out of compression based on the old HS20. Um, but now because of the trucks, it does go into tension. So we, we actually did some calculations, and it, it, by calculation, it should have fallen down onto I-84. ODOT put out a shoring, emergency shoring contract, uh, shored the bridge uh, temporarily till they could come up with a retrofit. And that's this negative positive dead load location at that section. It's a funky girder because it uh, changes geometry, gets deeper, gets wider, right? And so it's a 3D kind of a, fa of a, a thing. And we wanted to replicate that, so we built three different specimens, a full-scale replica of the existing one. As it was built, we call it Mosier 1. Uh, Mosier 2, where we strengthen it after we failed the girder, because that's kind of the designer's assumption, is that this girder has failed in place, and now we're going to try to retrofit it. So we failed the specimen first, and then we retrofitted it. That was two. And three is we strengthen it with our titanium, but without failing it first to see what happens. And we cherry-picked steel so we could match the, exactly the flexural and the shear strengths uh, in terms of calculations of what the existing girders would have been. So there's the details. This is the, it's a pretty quick experiment on the control specimen. Essentially you kind of go one, two, and it's over. And again, it failed because of that very poor lap splice location. And in fact, if you look at the crack locations in the girder and you look at the crack locations in the field, they're very close to one another. And here's the kind of the behavior of that. It's a very quick test, we like those. So you're done in a short period of time, but it's very limited capacity. The black line here is what the design strength you'd calculate, phi m sub n. And the orange line that's shown in there is actually what the demands are for the trucks that, that were being allowed to be over it. So it was literally under strength. And the predicted strength, we could, with some more advanced methods, we can predict the actual strength, but there's not a lot of room for, for uh, error there. And again, the designer's assumption is at the bottom. See if I can't make this video run because it's always fun to see videos. This is the failure of, this is Mosier 3. I asked for
Uh, so here's the response with the strength in titanium. And so you got a green curve and you got a blue curve. Remember, one of those I failed first and then I added the titanium. That's the green curve. It's actually the strongest of all of them. And that's not really what most people would guess, right? And the reason for that is if you fail at first, you get the steel to get out of the way. And so you let the titanium do, do the work because the, the, you've already failed the steel, it's slipped, right? All the bond is gone. And so the titanium gets to do all the work. The blue one is the one where we put the titanium on to this and the, the girder's still intact and then the steel wants to participate. Right? It's like you know, the little kid who wants to play Major League Baseball. They show up, they, they keep wanting to get to, to bat. They get in the way. And so it, eventually the, the steel will fail because the bond stresses get sufficiently high, and that causes additional damage to the concrete area. And so it drops the capacity just a little bit. Either way, right, you get significantly higher capacity than what you need. The one thing that's interesting is that the, the peak load here is not the actual rupture of the titanium. It's the rupture of the bond along the length. What you do is after you fail the bond, you drop down. I had my students unload, and then we reload it. And the only thing that's holding that beam together is the titanium bars with the hooks that are still embedded. And so it's a fully unbonded titanium bar with a 90 degree hook. So this is a case where you actually get a, ho a hook to hang your hat on after you fail the bond. Strength comes from bond, but the, the, you have a whole residual kind of lower shelf level that's based on hanging on to the hooks. And that alone is still above the, the demand, but the key there is you, you're, even with the fully ruptured bond, you're still above the design required uh, capacity, right? And this is what the, gr the bridge looks like after the fact. So real quick, there's a brand new ASTM spec that allows you to specify um, the material using the ASTM. It looks like a real ASTM because it is a real ASTM. It tells you the tensile properties, chemical requirements, bond strength, cross-sectional areas, and all the bending requirements. It's like what you'd have for rebar, right? So you can spec a material. There's a new design guide that's up for ballot for AASHTO to make it a national standard, which is a guide for the design and construction of near surface mounted titanium malloc bars. For strengthening, it probably says concrete bridges instead of structures. It's in the AASHTO LRFD format, has general conditions, materials, construction, installation design. It's what you'd expect to see to be able to design with this stuff uses everything that's kind of conventional. The beat of the titanium is you get to use the yield strength, right? So there's no real magic to the approaches that are there. I'll conclude. Titanium alloy bars, though they're not or haven't been widely considered, really have nice properties. They provide high, well-defined properties, which is a good thing. They have high strength. They have ductility and they have environmental durability. And that ability to incorporate a mechanical hook into the bar itself really makes them uh, advantageous. Uh, what we're asking the titanium to do in design is nothing more than what people would allow FRP to, to do, and FRP is relying solely on bond, and we're relying on bond and mechanical anchor. And so we believe that these combined attributes make uh, titanium alloy bars something that uh, economically uh, allows you to strengthen existing bridges and other structures. I want to acknowledge the Oregon Department of Transportation funded a lot of this research, and Bruce Johnson, our uh, chief bridge engineer, our technical advisory committees that provide good advice and insight, and the research group that manages that. And Perryman Company from Houston, Pennsylvania, which um, fabricates those bars for us uh, in the early days, and now they do it for production. Uh, and if you have questions about what the, that is, I don't know that part of it, but I think they're here. And a whole bunch of undergraduates helped us. And with that, I'll say thank you, and uh, happy to answer any questions if there's time. Just to confirm, and I may have missed it, you may have mentioned it, the, the specimen for Mosier 2, was that, that was the failed specimen from Mosier 1? That's right. Okay. Yeah. What are you saying the design life, would that add another 50 year design life to, a, to an existing bridge? Uh, it really comes down to what you believe the epoxy can do. Our, it, our, that's why we targeted all the fatigue stress ranges and all the freeze thaw cycles. We were saying 50 years, right? We want it to be able to perform 50 years. The nice thing about if, if you're worried about epoxy you know, deterioration, most of our, the, the important epoxy is in the hook, and that is pretty well protected by the core concrete around it. Uh, and the near surface mount is actually less susceptible to environmental durability because in terms of like UV and stuff like that or freeze thaw, really a lot of it is protected by the concrete because you're subsurface rather than just being at the skin of it. So we say 50 years, I don't have any heartburn over that. Uh, and for the titanium bars, I always joke that they'll be there at the end of the world. When the, yeah. when the whole thing turns to dust, there will be the cockroaches dancing on the, <laughs> on the gleaming titanium bars. Did you do any type of uh, cost comparisons? Uh, we did. Usually people like to know like price per pound. And I honestly, if you want to know price per pound, you know, I think the, the titanium people can give you what a price per pound is. 
it's the it's hard to really say that that's the right way to measure it because the unit weights don't make sense to steal. We think of it in terms of what you can do with it in terms of price per performance. The other thing is good structural epoxy is on par per like say on a foot of of repair. The epoxy is as expensive as the titanium. I would argue that you know epoxy if there's one material that you get what you pay for it's on the structural adhesive side of things and the first thing a contractor wants to do is to s replace the good epoxy that you want with the cheapest epoxy they can find if there's one thing that you cared about it would be the epoxy and the price you get what you pay for there but again you can't uh, you know like matt was saying thirty five thousand dollars what's a new bridge going to cost you and mobilization cost is huge too. It's my understanding that the most two recent pro projects we used it on, the, the cost consideration alone was what drove us to use titanium, that it was more cost efficient because we were able to reduce the number of bars we were putting in substantially. Sure, and, and a lot of that goes to cutting time. So if you have fewer bars you're putting in, it, there's once you do mobilization, mobilization is the same, right? That's where the cost is. Then it's labor for cutting grooves, placing the concrete, not concrete, but the epoxies, all the cleanup, all the lane closures, all of that. So time matters too. So if you can cut out, cut down on the time because you're putting less material in, there's all those savings that add up too. I think the number was on, on Mosier, it was 30% cheaper to do the titanium retrofit compared to the carbon fiber, even though no one had ever done titanium before. And contractors usually, when they haven't done anything, usually put in a markup factor on that. And it ran on time, on schedule, on budget. When you're using this material in a rehab, and if you're going to use impressed current system on this, there is certain limitation on the voltage that you can carry with those. Yeah, we're not using it for cathodic protection right now. Actually, we're doing research to be able to do cathodic protection and strengthening simultaneously. So that's a very interesting point. Nobody's done it before to, to use titanium for strengthening. And this alloy is not uh, the same material that you would use if you were using an impressed current cathodic protection system. You'd be using you know, a, a different titanium alloy, or not even an alloy. Uh, we are using them uh, in conjunction on D River, but they are isolated from one another. We are using the titanium near surface on the top surface of the deck, but the underside of the superstructure is receiving impressed current cathodic protection. And the, the epoxy, um, they located the rebar and the epoxy together will be isolating the titanium from any cathodic current. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.